as a research student when she had freshly returned from Canada and come to a Center for Historical Studies at JNU to do her PhD. She was a friend and an enthusiastic mentor to many young students, uh, which included me. Her subsequent career as a researcher and teacher has been extremely rich and fruitful. She has worked on diverse subjects, and her, um, the details of all her achievements are already there in the paper before you. She has also held several important professional positions uh, in her discipline, uh, both internationally as well as nationally, and she is also the uh, editor of Current Sociology. In her talk today, Sujata Patel poses before us the dilemma facing social sciences in the current moment of globalization, namely the need to establish a conceptual field in which the model of modernity derived from Europe's specific history uh, does not render the non-European experience as irrelevant, local, and particular. Such a process of intellectual devaluation occurred, for, uh, occurred first in the 19th century. These forms of knowledge which projected Europe as a universal model were subsequently critiqued by intellectuals inspired by nationalism and processes of decolonization in the global south. In the first part of her talk, the speaker will take us through important elements of that critique. <clears throat> in the latter part, uh, she will introduce us to newer intellectual challenges to the Eurocentric episteme in the social sciences. Here she will focus on three important perspectives from India, Africa, and Latin America that discuss how a more heterogeneous and inclusive modernity might be constructed by drawing upon non-European intellectual traditions. Uh, Sujata Patel is currently working on this theme uh, for a book, but she has already published a large number of articles on the subject. Most recently, um, at least this is from Professor Google, most recently in 2010, the Handbook of Diverse Sociological Traditions, and also in the same year, she wrote Sociology's Other, The Debate on European Universals in UNESCO's Encyclopedia of Life Support Systems. So uh, we look forward to an enthusiastic uh, discussion uh, following an, uh, about 40, 45 minutes of uh, presentation by uh, Dr. Patel. Sorry, can I uh, request everybody to put their phones on silent? <clears throat> Is 45 minutes okay? Yeah. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, thank you, Rashmi, for this warm and generous introduction. Um, and it's a pleasure to come back to Tinmurti. I was a fellow here in, in its early years of um, early years when the fellowship was instituted. So I've been most of the time on the other side of the table rather than on this side. And it's a pleasure to come back and um, um, at, the, at the invitation of Mahesh Rangarajan and I thank him for this opportunity. Um, I've got a prepared text which is a long text um, but I'll pick up parts of this to present today. And let me start with the introduction. I have noticed that most of the lectures in this series and many other at Teen Murti focus on some or the other aspect of contemporary trends that affect the country or parts of the country. My own recent empirical and analytical work can fit in with these discussions as these engage with an assessment of various trends regarding inequalities and exclusions in globalizing urban India. However, today, in this presentation, I'm moving away from the examination of empirical processes of the economy or the social or cultural trends organizing consumption in India to understand the epistemic orientation of disciplinary reservoirs or repertoires of our knowledge systems. My concern today is with the question, do these disciplinary reservoirs of knowledge, as we know of today, facilitate an assessment of the global trends and the way these affect not only India, but the entire world. Globalization implies that we need not be constrained in our empirical investigations by the borders and man-made boundaries of nation states territory. Rather, we need and should examine empirical trends, both causal and consequential, that concern itself with comparative analysis across, within, and crisscrossing these borders. 
As a consequence, we should ideally be able to assess all existing and potential group formations across local, regional, and global spaces. The question is, does our legacy of doing social sciences in India have the intellectual resources to frame the formulations of such theories and practices, or has this legacy restricted such ways of doing social science? This question directs me to make a historical assessment of the framing of social science theory in India, and particularly sociology and anthropology, and assesses moorings in the 19th century discourses of doing social theory. I'm arguing that the 19th century social science that, we, uh, that, uh, that is our legacy has structured the disciplines of social sciences, that is sociology, anthropology, economics, and political science, in terms of a hierarchy based on an epistemic difference of modern and pre-modern or traditional, and reduce this epistemic to spatial distinctions, that is the West and the East. This is known in social theory as European Eurocentric methodology or the coloniality of power. I suggest this epistemic hierarchy continues to structure disciplines and knowledge systems today and are a hindrance to the growth of global social science interdisciplinarity. In the first part of the paper, I discuss how a Eurocentric methodology based on colonial mentality uses the binaries of the universals and particulars to organize the disciplinary orientation of social sciences in its first phase of global transition from pre-modern to modern society in 19th century. Henceforth, universalistic propositions frame the disciplines of sociology, economics, and political science, which study modern and or later developed societies, while particularistic arguments and methods do the same for anthropology, the study of pre-modern or quote-unquote traditional societies. I'm arguing that this epistemic division legitimizes practices of knowledge production and divides knowledge and disciplines as that which pertains to imperial versus colonial countries. After the Second World War, this hierarchy extends itself as a methodological device regarding knowledge production about countries of the global north versus the global south. The second part of the paper thus focuses mainly on the disciplines of sociology and anthropology, though tangentially I also mention economics and politics in, in, and the way it is practiced in India, and also alludes to and discusses, therefore, how methodological nationalism, the major trope, which, uh, which assumes a covalence between society and the nation state, extends and expands this legacy of particularistic epistemy that we inherited through initially the anthropological discipline and now converts itself into the focus of the nation state and uses a nationalist oriented methodologies to further perpetuate this global hierarchy of knowledge production. In the last part of the paper, I discuss the relative merit of the other methodological interventions presented in the global south and ask whether some of these can reframe the 19th century epistemy of social sciences and make our theoretical and methodological practices more global. Anthropology was the first discipline or knowledge system. So this is my first part of the argument. Anthropology was the first discipline or knowledge system to be established in India. And I start my discussion with an assessment of the, its Eurocentric epistemic moorings located in 18th century discussions of European modernity. Levi Strauss famously stated, anthropology was a handmaiden of colonialism. And it is to this issue I now turn my attention. It is Samir Amin, and let me just mention a caveat. Much of the work I'm quoting is something that has been uh, um, expressed, articulated, and published in the last decade of the 20th century, and in the first part of the 21st century. And Eurocentrism as a theory is something that um, has emerged in this last two decades. And the first thinker that I approach now is Samir Amin, who is the first theorist who presents an historical argument regarding the growth of the Eurocentric epistemy in the 18th century, when he argues that this 
uh, episteme is entwined in the twin processes of crystallization of the European society and Europe's conquest of the world. Eurocentricism, I mean, argues, clothed these twin processes by emphasizing the first and disregarding the significance in the formation of the first of the latter. Amin's argument is presented at three levels. He contends that Europe was the periphery of the Mediterranean tributary states, whose center was its eastern edge. Scholastic and metaphysical culture of these tributary systems created four systems of scholastic metaphysics, Hellenistic, Eastern Christian, Islamic, and Western Christian. Why all of these contributed to the formation of culture and consciousness of Europe, it was the contribution of Egypt and later of medieval Islamic scholastics which was decisive in changing Europe's culture from being metaphysical to scientific. He shows how since the period of Renaissance in Europe, the history of Europe diluted and distilled this heritage and replaced it with another history that narrated its growth as being the sole consequence of its birth within the Hellenic and Roman civilization. And thus, thirdly, through the means of a somatic slippage, the European narrative made Europe the center of the world and modern civilization, the distinctive characteristic of what was science and universal reason. The rest of the world was constructed to be its peripheries, which it was argued could not or did not have the means of becoming modern. Wallerstein has, Emmanuel Wallerstein has extended this argument to suggest that Eurocentrism is also a theory of social science. As latter, it is able to naturalize the distinction between scientific universalism against essential particulars as it develops a discourse in the 19th century through the mode of historiography, the analysis of Western civilization, and through Orientalism as it imposes a theory of progress. These trends crystallize what Wallerstein calls an original epistemology, which becomes a key element in maintaining the reproduction of modernity. This argument is further extended by the Chilean, Argentinian philosopher and the Chilean sociologist, Enric Dussel and Anibal Quijano, when they assert what, not only what Amin had said earlier, but they suggest, in a manner similar to Amin, that the European narrative and its theory of history simultaneously makes invisible and silences events, processes, and actions of violence against the rest of the world, without which Europe could not become modern, and then presents the, it's this, after silencing this set of events, presents itself as, be, as an interior-oriented historiography. They extend this thesis to suggest that Eurocentrism is not only a theory of history, but an episteme, a theory of power knowledge. Second, this episteme, now called categorical imperative, here there's a quote to Kant, simultaneously creates the knowledge of I, that is Europe, the moderns, the West against the other, the peripherals, non-modern, and the East. This perspective legitimizes a theory of separate and divided nature of the knowledge of West and East. It divides the attributes of the West and the East by giving value to two divisions. One is universal, superior, and emancipatory. The other is particular, non-emancipatory, and inferior. Dussel quotes Immanuel Kant, who argues that European enlightenment is the exodus of humanity by its own efforts from the state of guilty immaturity. And laziness and cowardice are the reasons why the great part of humanity remain pleasurably in the state of immaturity. This inferiority, a condition of it not being modern, in turn further legitimizes the need to emulate the moderns and to accept the colonizing process as a civilizing process. Third, and uh, this is most significant for us, Eurocentric knowledge is based on the construction of multiple and repeated divisions or oppositions which get constructed as hierarchies. These oppositions, according to Anibal Quijano, it's based on a racial classification of the world population. This principle becomes 
the assumption to further divide the peoples of the world in geocultural terms and which are, atta which are attached further oppos oppositions such as reason versus body, science versus religion, subject versus object, culture versus nature, masculine versus feminine, modern versus traditional. European modernity, if it conceptualized its own growth in linear time, it sequestered the various East divided between two cultural groups, the primitives and barbarians, and the civilized as being enclosed in their own spaces. No wonder this epistemy could not provide the resources to elaborate a theory of space, affirming Marx's insightful statement of, quote, annihilation of space by time, unquote. The consolidation of these attributes across west-east axis and its subsequent hierarchization across spatial regions in the world allow for social science to discover the, quote, nature of the various peoples, nations, and ethnic groups in the world in terms of attributes of the binary. <coughs> and thus, Anibal um, um, Kihano suggests that this, which he calls coloniality of power, is founded on two myths. The first, <coughs> that the history of human civilization is a trajectory that de departed from the state of na nature and culminated in Europe. And second, a view of differences between Europe and non-Europe non as natural and racial and not consequent of the history of power. These assumptions became seminal in the framing of disciplines of sociology and anthropology in the 19th century. <coughs> sociology became the study of modern Europe, while anthropology became the study of non-European and traditional societies. The sociology studied how the new societies evolved from deadwood of the old. A notion of time and history was embedded in its discourse. Contrarily, so anthropology studied how space plays organized static culture that could not transcend in internal structure to become modern. This is, of course, the frames on which both sociology and anthropology structured itself in the 19th century. These frames constructed the academic knowledge of India, as elaborated by colonial ad anthro anthropologists and administrators who further divided the East that they were studying in separate geopolitical spatial territories, with each territory given an overarching value. In the case of India, the overarching value was Hinduism. The discourse of coloniality collapsed India and Hinduism into each other, Later, there, those living in the subcontinent were further classified geographically in spatial cultural zones and regionally subdivided by its relationship with Hinduism. Those that were directly related to Hinduism, such as castes and tribes, were termed the majority and organized in terms of distinct hierarchies. As we know, castes were considered more superior than tribes in the way in which what Nicholas Dux calls the ethnographic state was organized while those who were then conceived as minorities were thought of something separately and had a very weak relationship or none with caste. Fourth, this classificatory scheme, that of the use of attribute of race to divide the peoples of the world, found its quote-unquote, therefore, local legitimation its own articulation, and a voice once colonial authorities had imposed these to divide the quote-unquote natives. This project found a expression, ironically and paradoxically, in the work of indigenous intellectuals in the subcontinent searching to fight an identity against the colonialism. <clears throat> For them, the immediate necessity was to locate our modernities. Thus, Unlike the Europeans, for whom the quote, the present was the site of one's escape from the past, for the indigenous Indian, Indian intellectuals, it is precisely the present from which we feel we must escape, unquote. As a result, the desire to be creative and search for a new modernity got transposed to the past of India, a past ironically constructed by Orientalist colonial modernity. No wonder, and I quote Pata Chatterjee here, we construct a picture of those days, 
when there was beauty, prosperity, and healthy sociability. This makes the very modality of our coping with modernity radically different from the historically evolved modes of Western modernity. The past now becomes rarefied to understand the present and the future. An Orientalist imagination comes to define the so-called indigenous expression. In a different way, the historian Sumit Sarkar makes a similar argument when he suggests that while modern Western history writing has generally been state-oriented with an understanding of a nation as a reflection of the nation state, the historical, historical consciousness of the Indian intelligentsia in the late 19th and early 20th century was oriented to the valorization of culture against the state. He states, and it's important to quote him here, in this period, Samaj, which is society or community, came to be counterposed to Rashtra or Raj Shakti, state, the political domain. The real history of India, it was repeatedly asserted, was located in the first not the second, for Samaj embodied the distinctive qualities peculiar to the genius, culture, and the religion of the Indian people. And Samaj was simultaneously all too often conceptualized in Hindu, high caste, and paternalistic terms. Obviously, the racial construction of difference emerging out of the Eurocentric position now finds a new legitimacy within a Brahminical casteist ideology, and these two overlap with each other to organize the study of social sciences through new con reconstructed majoritarian or and or casteist positions, or through rationalist secular silences of this process. That, in turn, allows its legitimation. Eurocentric episteme does, to conclude my first part, becomes part of the background understanding and beliefs which have obfuscated a critical look at knowledge production in social, of social sciences in India. In the case of India, this knowledge, one, was not only produced as part of colonial politics of rule, but expressed and organized itself in terms of values that were opposed to modernity, at least in the field of anthropology, used disciplinary practices such as Indology and ethnography to elaborate these positions. Four, was codified with the help of native intelligentsia, especially the Brahmins, and this work I'm drawing on from both Cohn and Nicholas Dux. And fifthly, thus reflects the social order as represented by this group, both in its express articulations in anthropology and later social anthropology, and in its silences. And it's very important to mention, I particularly am interested in the silences. And it's, this is true in, its, in the discipline of economics, which refuses to understand that inequalities and the laboring process and the whole process of capitalist development is also related to caste. And this relationship you don't find at all articulated in any, and I'll look at, into it in the next section. And lastly, it mitigated an, examina an examination of the way the classifications of the state, organized now during colonialism, reformulates and sometimes establishes new forms of inequalities in the colonial territory. And this has still not been engaged with by a large number of both historians and social scientists. So I move on to the second part, which is nationalism and nationalist social sciences. What's the time? Uh, yeah? Yeah. The legacy of Eurocentrism was thus not only in creating a global hierarchy of knowledge divisions in terms of the universal in particular, but to ensure that this episteme is diffused across the colonial space. And through this process, obfuscates an analysis of the principles organizing the transition process across the colonialized world. Chatterjee has reminded us that, quote, there is no promised land of modernity outside the network of power, unquote. And I may add, outside its discourse. Modernity together for the once colonized brought two promises, the struggles for dreams of freedom at the same time being exp be having experienced the victims of modern or being victims of modernity 
It's, orga it's epistemy organized both the desire for power and the resistance of power. This discussion on modernity in India has therefore been steeped in ambiguity, given colonialism's framing of modernity as a discourse simultaneously of freedom and of subjugation. Nationalism structured an understanding both of being unfree and free to change the world. And in so doing, it now constructed a colonial binary in a new context, that of the nation state. How did this ambiguity play itself out in the context with the framing of nationalist social sciences? As in the case of many countries, and so was it in India, social science disciplines were moved in the project of nationalism. And there were three different currents which affected the framing of social sciences in India. This was the the three currents being the modernist, the traditionalist, and the modern, tra modern traditionalists. All three accepted that the problem was with colonialism and that the extraction and control for Im imperialist pur purposes of India's rich material sources and the destructions of its vitality and ideas by the colonial elite were the main problems that India faced. But there were differences regarding the possible solution. <coughs> The modernists wanted, to, wanted, wanted India to identify with the future and with progress. They argued the problem was with the past, with Indian culture, which was made the Indian people passive, lifeless, and non-productive. They advocated the path set by Europe earlier and wanted India to have a new industrial economy, free from agrarian dependencies. It's no coincidence that these ideas became the source of building a new discipline of economics, and also was part of generally the Marxist theore theoretical frameworks and helped to chart a knowledge regarding planning and development in independent India. This knowledge, as we know, has rarely engaged with and often been silenced regarding the issues of pollution and purity that structure and organize inequalities in the country. It is this silence that continues to accept the colonial episteme. The modernist perspective was countered by the traditionalists. They argued for a need to draw out completely new concepts and theories, but not from Europe, but from India's past. And this, in this, they had completely aligned themselves with the colonial episteme because they thought that India's past was related to India's rich histories and its civilization. Indian society, according to them, had a distinct character and history, and, um, did not, and they didn't want to have Indians to imitate the West. The main figure in this is, is someone who's considered by sociologists as the father of sociology, G.S. Gurier who used an Orientalist methodology to discuss quote-unquote indigenous concepts that organize Indian traditions. And this is what used to be taught as sociology from the 50s, 60s, 70s, caste, tribe, family systems, and Hinduism. The third trend, the modern traditionalists frame the ideas of syncretism and can be seen in the work of social scientists such as D.P. Mukherjee and even Radha Kamal Mukherjee to an extent. The goal of modern traditionalists was to understand the present and use the language of the, or, or to understand the problems of the present, but use the language of the past to try and see how it can be uh, comprehended most adequately. And we find in the early part of the development of political science, uh, the suggestion that democracy had an indigenous moorings which you find in the early work of Ratni Kotari, is, is part of this trend. The nationalist orientation created a distinct methodology, which we can call methodological nationalism. It allowed, quote unquote, society to be collapsed to the nation state, and the nation state to be imagined as a nation as constructed by its elite. Or in other words, the nation was created as, quote, the natural and necessary representation of the modern society as perceived by and envisioned by its upper caste patriarchal elite. It assumed that the nation consisted, therefore, of discrete groups, unrelated and, un in, uh, and equal with each other, 
which they called caste because they defined it as occupational. And that diversity is the nation's signature and that economics as a discipline and its theories of development and planning will help to reframe the social and cultural. Henceforth, this hegemonic imagined vision of the state's ruling groups and their practices and dispositions became the frame of doing social science, thereby not only silencing the recognition of marginalities of all kinds, but also advocating its almost virtual disappearance in some of the languages of social sciences in the first few decades after independence. If one attribute of inequality was recognized by the new nation state, it was that of income and was related to a diff, a diff, another diffuse concept called poverty. There were, of course, dissenting voices, such as those from the Marxists, to this position, but this intervention was cumulatively and remained weak. It is no co coincidence, thus, to note that contemporary social science language remained mute to the political moorings of the project, its imbrications in the colonial epistemy, and its close linkage with the metropolitan advanced capitalism and its embeddedness to the dynamics of capital accumulation <clears throat> at the national level to enhance it at the world scale. It took for granted official discourses, agendas, loyalties, and histories without problematizing them. Additionally, methodological nationalism took for granted the fact that nation-state boundaries are natural boundaries of India. The social sciences territorialized the caste and gendered elite visions of the nation imbricated in the colonial epistemy and used these lens to understand groups bounded within the confines of the nation-state. This orientation stamped the extensive production of social science literature that took place in India after 47. And here I'm just discussing this till 1970s and 80s when there has been a lot of changes in all these disciplines. All narratives of social sciences acknowledge the fact that after independence, the nation state intervened to ensure an extensive institutionalization of knowledge systems through various uh, institutions from university education to research institutes and research funding institutes. This re reinforced the close functional relationship between Indian academics and the systems of higher education. And by extension, between the project of knowledge creation and the elite upper class and savanna conceptions and patriarchal conceptions of nationhood. No wonder what developed in India was a culture of professionalization that equated social science knowledge to state's policy interventions. This was unlike Europe, where social science is developed through a reflexive and or public intervention. And its professional, professionalization was related to these two orientations. Thus, this nationalist perspective legitimized the idea that if Indians as citizens do research, they are rid of the colonial moorings of social science research, and that nationalist regulations will constrain any further inequities in knowledge production. However, Eurocentrism is not only an epistemy. It's also a way to organize production, distribution, consumption, and reproduction of knowledge unequally through the different parts of the world. The Malaysian thinker Saidu Senalatas has called this a captive mind. And Pauline Hutanji, the African philosopher, has called it extroversion. They argue that, the sim that this syndrome, either of captive mind or extraversion, can be seen in the teaching and learning processes, in the way the curriculum and syllabi is framed, in the processes of doing research, the designing of research questions, and in the methods and methodologies being used. In the formulation of criteria adopted for accepting articles for journals and books, <coughs> and ultimately in defining what and where one publishes, and what is ac academic excellence. The argument here is that the trenches of the epistemy are deep and layered. Thus, this epistemy cannot merely be replaced through cognitive supplants of concepts, theories, and methods. What are best, that is what at best, national social science attempted to do. The consequence of this dependence <coughs> has been an infantilization of scientific practices within the global south regions, and I would suggest also in India. <coughs> if you look 
at university education and its training across the country. <clears throat> Not only are these at an incipient stage of growth, but this very condition encourages brain drain and further intellectual dependencies. Additionally, an intellectual culture defined by northern social sciences is held out as a model for the rest of the world. It's backed by sheer size of its intellectual, human, physical, and capital resources, together with the infrastructure that is necessary for its reproduction. <coughs> this includes not only equipment, but archives, libraries, publishing houses, and journals. An evolution of a professional culture of intellectual commitment and engagement, which connects the producers and consumers of knowledge, institutions such as university and students having link across nation states from the, globe, uh, from the global south and global north, which Farid al has called academic dependency. <coughs> this is a history, not only of India, but Nigeria, Brazil, or South Africa. The scholars have got some positive outcomes of this strategy, but these outcomes have been very uneven. And as you know, in a survey on, on social science in India, <coughs> 10 years back, um, a Delhi-centric uh, social science has been one of the problems that has been highlighted. The strategy, strategy thus has not only been questioned, Euro, uh, has not questioned Eurocentrism as an epistemy. What has been at its basic problem has been that Eurocentrism has institutionalized an upper caste elite patriarchal positions. Those who produce the knowledge are also consuming the same knowledge. In this context, how this, can this power be displaced? So I come to the last part and discuss some of the um, strategies put together by various thinkers on this. Since the late 70s, and particularly after the 90s, the dynamics of the world has changed. At one level, the world has contracted. It has opened up possibilities of diverse kinds of transborder flows and movements of capital and labor, and of signs and symbols, organized oftentimes in intersecting spatial circuits. It's no longer north to south or east to west, and space no longer encapsulates culture at all points of time. While in some contexts and moments these attributes cooperate, at other moments they are in conflict and contest each other. Thus, even though we live in one global capitalist world with a dominant form of modernity, inequalities and hierarchies are increasing. But so are fragmented identities. Lack of access to livelihoods, infrastructure, and political citizenship is important but they now blend with exclusions relating to cultural and group identity and are organized in varied spatial and temporal zones. Fluidity of identities and their content, continuous expression in unstable social manifestations and in new geographical domains demand a fresh perspective to assess and examine them. Not only do contemporary social processes, sociabilities, and structures need to be perceived through new and novel spaces, prisms, and perspectives, but it's increasingly clear that these need to be seen from new methodological protocols. So what is the new protocol that one can put together? Emmanuel Wallerstein, in his long essay on uh, Eurocentrism, suggests that it is, it is very important to, to acknowledge the particularity of Europe's reconstruction. So his location being within North America, he suggests the only way out is for the North American and the European worlds to accept that they, have, they need not present a universalistic position as they did in the 19th century. Rather, they should particularize themselves and arrive at, therefore, uh, inclusive many particularities across the world. So one way out is to suggest that, and it's similar to what Dipesh Chakravarti calls provincialization, to provincialize Europe, he says, was precisely to find out how and in what sense European ideas that are universal 
were at the same time drawn from particular intellectual and historical traditions, and that they cannot and should not and will never claim universal validity. This is the first um, intervention, methodological intervention. But as we can see, a much more of this intervention is located to the work already in, of history in Europe and North America, and also of sociology in North America and Europe. In this context, what do we do based as we are and located in the global south and particularly in India? I would argue that we need to evolve a twofold strategy. On one hand, there's a need to deconstruct and provincialize Eurocentricism. So while they would provincialize universalisms, we need to provincialize both universalisms and particularity because together the two define the way in which we have structured our social knowledge. And also make discrete its entanglement with casteist and patriarchal ideologies, imageries, and dispositions in social science theories and practices. This is what Hutunji means when he advocates the need for endogenizing, not indigenizing, but endogenizing social science, suggesting that all nationalist knowledge are particularistic, need to be particularistic, should be particularistic, and thus part and <clears throat> and needs to be displaced. This particularism needs to be displaced because ultimately social science has to actually be universal without it being imperialist. How does one do so? He presents a new alternative, which he calls, as I said, endogeneity. The latter appropriates and assimilates through a critical mind. So it is a strategy against the provincialism. The latter appropriates and assimilates through a critical mind all international heritage available, including the universal and the particular of the 19th century, including the methodological nationalism of the 20th century. So that's all, in uh, all international heritage has to be understood and app apprehended, including also the scientific and technological interventions and interface this with the critical assessment and reappropriation of one's own heritage, recognizing its adaptability and creativity. This, he says, is not traditionalism, but its exact opposite. Much the same is suggested by Enric Dussel through his conception of transmodernity. Dussel suggests a need for a new theory of modernity that simultaneously comprehends the dialectic of exploitation together with the epistemic subjugation, which ex excavates and builds new versions as they manifest themselves through an exterior reading of history. Transmodernity affirms from without the essential components of modernity's own excluded cultures in order to develop a new civilization for 21st century. In the context of India, this perspective implies a necessity to explore not only the pre-modern, but also the way colonialism and later nationalism mobilized Brahminical and patriarchal visions through first the colonial state and then through the nationalist state, together with social science perspectives and absented an analysis of the same to assess and organize inequities and exclusions since the late 19th century. This implies, secondly, a need to go beyond the content of the social sciences. That is, the explanations they offer and the narratives they construct, shaped as they are by the genealogies that is both European and colonial. Rather, we need to analyze their very form, that is, the concepts through which explanations become possible, including the very idea of what counts as an explanation. This is what social theory has generally tried to do since the 80s and 90s, to find out how to understand methodology, to understand the relationship between science, fact, and empirical um, attributes, and to reformulate how these are related to each other in the context of how they, are, they have come to, come to us in understanding the relationship between them. So it is not possible, I agree, 
that social sciences have to displace the European because it was wrong. Such an argument has little relevance given the fact that we are and remain within one world system. We cannot dispense with categories, but it's important to deconstruct the way science and methods and methodologies had constructed them, and then to reconstruct, even though through new, partial, and oftentimes flawed understandings. We need not reinvent the wheel. However, there is necessity to generate new and creative explanations that are relevant for different contexts and different historical periods. Thank you.